I almost don't need to do the presentation. She explained everything in the introduction so we can all go here for a quick coffee. Maybe better, right? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for, for having me here in India. It's, uh, I've been on a bit of a whirlwind tour. I was in uh, uh, China last week in three cities. I was in Australia the week before. And I've already covered three cities in two days here in India. I've been to Chennai, Kochi, and Bangalore. So at some point, I'm, everything's becoming a bit of a blur. But what an incredible country India is. Uh, when I flew into to Kochi, uh, my good buddy Vimal was telling me this is the uh, airport which is completely powered by solar. Like, I have not seen anything like that in the world. And I mean, that's incredible ingenuity here in India. So my congratulations to you and the, and the innovations that all of you here in the room are actually driving forward. I'm going to jump in fairly quickly because... 15 minutes is normally how much time I take to introduce myself, but I have to go ahead and cover an entire session. So data. You've all been hearing people talk about data. In fact, you know what? I've been standing upside. Let's make the cameraman work. I'm going to come down and present to you. You people have been sitting here. Everyone presents over here. I'm going to come over here and present just to you, sir. Okay? You and me are going to be best friends by the end of this day. All right? All right, good. Let's talk about data. You're going to hear me talk about things you have heard many times before, but there's trends that are continually evolving around data, right? Data itself, hey, you know what? Exponential growth. How many times have you heard that? Everybody says data is growing, growing, growing. And it is, but it's growing at an accelerated rate. It doesn't grow at a rate which is measured, which is stable. It has spurts and jumps ahead. And all of a sudden, we see technology spur data forward and we start to react. And how do we start to think about storing and processing and transporting? Data grows crazily at the moment. The second area we see massive challenges in is that data is generated everywhere. Just in China last week, I was walking around China and looking at uh, the light posts. And every light post, there was like seven cameras. China has basically something along the lines of 650 security cameras every square kilometre. 650, the biggest in the world. What are they collecting? Data. Not just the IoT data, but video data. How big is video? You download an Excel spreadsheet, maybe a couple of megabytes. You download a movie on Disney+, Plus, it's a couple of gigabytes. And these guys are capturing information non-stop all the time. Scary, but true. And then finally, this is the interesting one, huge untapped value, right? We have this situation right now where everybody has the FOMO effect, right? Fear of missing out. I must capture everything. Have you got data? Give me your data. Do you have data? Give me your data. I need all the data. But the reality is there's a lot of data we capture which actually doesn't have value. But we are really scared about not getting it. So we still are struggling to understand what is valuable and what isn't. You know, technologies like metadata is helping us understand better how to identify the value of data, identify where it is, but we still think we need everything. So we see these pushing factors in data, pushing out in terms of what's going on, and customers tend to have to react to this. But we also see factors pushing in. So we see massive amounts of regulation coming in. Every week, Regulation's almost changing. You know, gone are the days when we were IT professionals. I know many people have different roles, but I've been a developer, I've been an IT professional. I used to come to work and work on technology. Now an IT professional has to be a lawyer. They need to understand the regulations of the day that they work with. They need to understand the regulations of the infrastructure they work with, right? Because if they get it wrong, they get in trouble, or their company gets fined millions of dollars. And it's not just regulations, but now we have this massive push on cyber resiliency. And people think about cyber resiliency as how do you protect against ransomware and hackers and things like that, and yes, that's important. But now you have regulations like DORA coming in, which say you must meet certain resiliency requirements. If not, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So you have to understand how to apply it and how to protect against it. The third area is innovation. And I love it. The whole conference, people have been talking about AI and cloud and what we can actually do with those technologies. And maybe in a couple of years, it'll be something else. It'll be quantum. How's your quantum computing strategy? What are you doing with quantum computing? We all have to do quantum computing. Innovation's great. I love innovation. My wife hates me sometimes because I innovate too much. Right? I keep wanting to change the voice activation in the house from 
Google Voice Assistant to an Amazon Voice Assistant to, at one point I did a Cortana with Microsoft, and that didn't last too long. I worked for 10 years at Microsoft, so I had to evangelize their products. But technology is constantly changing. We see now that everybody in the organization is more educated on technology than ever before. So you have the board members saying to the IT department, hey, we need to adopt Kubernetes. Hey, we need to put AI into everything. And all of a sudden, you have to keep chasing and chasing every single innovation that comes to market. And then finally, the skill set. It's quite challenging to keep up to date with skills to address all of these different opportunities. I might need somebody to yell out to me when I've got five minutes left because I won't be looking at the screen. So we see this as a data effect. This is the effect that data is actually having on all organizations across the world. Public, private, small, large, everything. Everybody's impacted by all of these aspects of the data effect. Now, at Hitachi Vantara, it's kind of funny. We're not necessarily a cloud company you would recognize. In fact, sometimes people don't recognize Hitachi Vantara at all. I had someone in China talk about uh, Hitachi the first time they were introduced to it as an infrastructure company, and they said, I thought Hitachi just built elevators. <laughs> we had to go ahead and re-educate in terms of what we did, but now they understand the sort of technology and the innovations that we drive forward. And we've looked at this, when we think about a data challenge or a data effect, you can't solve this with a single product. This is not a product sell. Everybody here has talked about innovation in terms of building solutions. I can't say to you, buy this box and it will solve your data challenges. We need to make sure that when we address opportunities in the data effect, we offer opportunities of choice. So being able to help customers realize that data is not just data. Data has various formats, has various structures. So we need to say, look, are you dealing with massive amounts of video? Well, then maybe you should be looking at file. Or are you looking at massive amounts of unstructured data that you need to identify and maybe use object? If you're looking at highly transactable databases, maybe use block. But you need to enable some form of choice. Now, that's just a storage, so I'm going to wave your picture. Do you want me to stand in it as well? Or? No, okay. I thought it was handsome today, but okay. Um, it's not just about the storage. You need to think that end-to-end. Right? So the storage at the bottom helps you capture, manage, protect your data, but then you also need to think through the software to make it happen. You start thinking about the compute power to make it happen. Is it GPU-driven compute? Is it general-purpose compute? How do we integrate in cloud? We do cloud as well. In fact, we've heard somebody talk about multi-cloud. I actually say go beyond that. It's hybrid multi-cloud. You need to be able to bring the best assets of what you have on-premise and enrich that with cloud services. That's the ultimate goal of where we need to get to. Now, at this point, you're probably saying, Matt, that seems a bit boring. You guys are selling boxes, right? Can't be very exciting from a solution point of view. Well, I get that. And I'm going to show you a solution which is pretty cool, right? But before I talk about that, oh, maybe I will talk about it. Does anybody know what this is? Actually says it in the title. It's not much of a guess, is it? You have you seen the Las Vegas sphere? Yeah, the band U2, you know U2? It's a beautiful day. No? Oh. Uh, the more culturally relevant. Is it better? Okay. You two doesn't know that song. One day we'll teach them. The Las Vegas Sphere. This thing is crazy. I have to talk about this. I had to write some stats down. Okay. The outside of this building. This is a building, right? It seats 40,000 people. The outside is 580,000 square feet. 580,000 square feet. The inside of this structure has an inside of 160,000 square feet. It delivers the highest resolution imagery on a building in the world. It delivers 16K resolution images. Now, sounds cool. We'd all love a 16K TV in our house, right? I have 4K right now. I, my wife won't let me spend any money on that. But to make this happen, and if you see the videos of this thing, it is beautiful. It moves, it's animated, the eye blinks, it puts all sorts of imagery on there. But to do that, you need to understand how to be able to wrangle data really, really well. Now, what this does is, we actually built the technology to be able to deliver four petabytes of data at 400 gigabits per second from 28 servers, bang, onto the screens. 
this thing is the fastest in the world in terms of delivering data. And why is fast important? Because you think about the experience that the user has at the end of the day. Now, for this user, there's 40,000 users in that room, right? They have to be able to walk in there and see this work absolutely perfectly and seamlessly every single time. You need to be able to understand implicitly how data works to be able to deliver that. Now, this same technology is also technology that is empowering hospitals today to do genome sequencing, to help actually identify diseases in, uh, or illnesses in children in hospitals. Same technology. Why do I need this technology? Because it has to be fast. You need to be able to get results. To be able to get the right results at the right pace, you need to have excellent infrastructure to be able to go and do it. Again, enriched by cloud services, enriched by software. But this is what it takes to really deliver the best experience for users. Your user might be an audience member, your user might be a doctor, your user might be somebody at home trying to do the internet banking. That requires reliability and resiliency. So, one last thing I want us to talk about here is also environmental sustainability. Super, super critical. Everyone's talking about environmental sustainability. This is something that we take pride in. Every time we release new technology, we think about what is the impact on the environment. So from design to delivery to recycling, we have constantly thought about the greenhouse emissions from our products into the environment. And we've been proud to say that with every single release, we have actually been able to reduce those greenhouse gases and actually make a significant impact. So when you think about services like AI, which we all know has massive compute, massive consumption of, of energy, we need to look at ways we can actually balance things. So how in the management of data can we reduce carbon emissions to ensure we can actually help with the greenhouse, or at least the environmental sustainability aspects of the environment? Let me see, how much more time have I got left? I'm sure the organizers didn't think I'd be looking that way. Two and a half minutes left. So those are the things that we're doing with data today. All the things I've talked about, the sphere, data management, high-speed data, we can do this all today. If you come up to me and say, Matt, I need to do high-speed data, we can talk about it. But where do we take it forward? Right? We always need to be keeping pushing ourselves forward. Again, people think that we might just be an infrastructure company, but we recognize that we need to completely innovate data because the world of people who are using data, it's changing. Somebody who was a uh, business person now has to be a data analyst, has to be somebody who can take data and make predictions about their business. They're going to use different types of applications. We need to help them take this platform and enhance it for a more modern digital age. This is still very modern today, but we want to push ourselves to go forward and help all of our customers do this. And so one of the areas we're moving towards is how do we unify platforms around data? How do we make it simpler for people? Right? Remember we talked at the beginning, skills being a challenge and things like that. We've got to make things simpler. So our future is to take all of these technologies, as great as they are, and unify it. It doesn't matter if your application or your strategy is to use something like block storage or object or file. Maybe you're not even thinking about that. But when we think about data, we think about those structures, we want to make it simpler. We don't want silos of information. We want to unify things together so if you choose a particular type of storage along the bottom, you use consistency in your tool sets. You have choices in the way you consume. If you want to consume things in the cloud, you can consume them into the cloud. In fact, I always have conversations with uh, customers about this hybrid cloud technology and how many customers move data to the cloud and it kind of sits there and they get billed for it and it starts to become very costly and frustrating. I challenge them and say, why don't you move some of the data to the cloud, do the processing, and delete it? And many people go, oh, why would I delete the data? Right? Well, you've already got it on-prem. Just replicate it, do the work, get rid of it. When I drive my car from point A to point B, do I worry about the consumption of the petrol? Not so much. I would like to move to an electric car, but in Singapore, electric cars are very expensive. We'll get better at some point. But the idea is that as we get to this unified platform, you might ingest or capture information one way, but then you might have a different way of consuming it. Your application might capture it from a video camera, like in China, but then your developers might use something like S3 to consume the application data. So it's all about choice. So when we think about the future, 
we recognize that we need to understand data, understand its characteristics, be able to give you choice in the way you consume it and deliver it, and then also give you the ability and the trust to make sure that your data will be able to be there and support your business. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time I have. I want to thank you so much for letting me be here in your country. My name's Matthew Harbin. Please come and have a chat. Love to talk to you. Thank you.